Okay, we should be good. Hello, Web Shadowers. Thank you all for attending our session this evening. I am a new face, so I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kayleen and I'm a junior at Rutgers University and I study exercise science. I've been working with the Web Shadowers team since December. I helped make certificates when everyone was requesting those. And then I joined the team officially last month as a verification manager and here I am hosting. So for my first session, I have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Mattel, who will be continuing his ultrasound se series, excuse me. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of the video at the end. With that being said, Dr. Mattel, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I know it's late for some of you. I apologize. I was um, I was rounding in the hospital and got back, but I am here. Thanks for whoever is here, and I hope more people join. Let me share my screen, and let's jump into it. Hopefully, some of you guys saw last week um, for part one. Part two is about to start. So here we here we go. All right. Um, as usual, I like to keep it super informal, super super informal and casual. I am I'm having trouble pulling up the live chat. Usually, I have it up. So I'll be monitoring for questions um, to my host. Like I mentioned before, if you see a good question, feel free to you know interrupt me and ask, and we will we will go. I have some question slides built in, so we will we will see how we do. Um, just a little bit about me, as per my other presentations. I uh, went to undergrad at the University of California, Irvine, in Southern California. Uh, did my medical school at a DO school called Turo in Northern California. Um, completed my family medicine residency at one of the Baylor programs out near Austin, Texas, and currently working as an attending at Southern California in um, the Kaiser Permanente system. Just some disclosures, general stuff, nothing disclosed, no financial incentives. These are all example cases and there's no real patient information. Um, objective. So same as last time, right? We're going to talk about ongoing uses of ultrasound in different parts of the body. Um, we're going to try to integrate some basic knowledge and um, um, terminology that's used in ultrasound typically, you know, just gets you accustomed to the lingo and whatnot. Last time we talked about ocular eye ultrasound, finding an IUD, abscesses versus cellulitis, um, renal, so kidneys and DVT. And this time it's gonna be a few more things. So I'm still having trouble pulling up the live chat. So again, to my host, if you see any good questions, just feel free. One of my quotes, you can't save people with pride and the trust that people comes with merit. You know, it, this holds true for POCUS or point of care ultrasound and using ultrasound as well as just medicine in general. You know, you, as I mentioned before in previous things, you will come to a point in your, in your training when you all get to this point um, that, you know, you'll see that you'll see a few patients, you would have read up on a lot of stuff and you're thinking, you know what, I got this. Like, I know this, I have a really good sense of how the medicine works. And I feel really confident in doing that. And, um, you know, that's the most dangerous mindset to get into. So if you feel a lot of pride in your knowledge, then I promise you, you're missing something. Um, showing your experience, showing you can save people, showing that you know when to ask for help, um, showing that you can work as part of a team, you know, gaining that merit as you go through your training is responsible. And so, you know, the process of learning and you know becoming an independent practitioner um comes with merit and comes with trust so um that's that's my one of my quotes for you guys so let's start with um something called the fast exam or e-fast extended fast exam let's start with the case a 30 year old healthy male arrives into the trauma bay of the er brought in by ambulance after a motor motor vehicle accident he was the driver of a sedan traveling at 55 miles an hour and was hit head on by an oncoming truck there was airbag deployment and no loss of consciousness. He was placed in a cervical collar and arrived in the ER 30 minutes after the accident. He arrives on a stretcher. He is conscious and does respond to commands. He's alert and oriented times three. He is hypotensive. His blood pressure is down to 87 over 50. His pulse is 118, so he's tachycardic. 
on, you know, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of how to do a trauma assessment. Um, you know, part of it is you keep them in a cervical collar. You have a whole team of people, like four people to move the patient, roll them onto the side so you can feel the spine and, you know, to assess for any obvious evidence of spinal um, injury, bony injury. So no spinal tenderness on palpation. Anal sphincter tone is intact. That's important because you want to make sure there's no spinal cord damage. That's a common thing that you do in a trauma situation. Uh, minor superficial skin lacerations seen on the body and et cetera, et cetera, right? There's ongoing CT workup. You get labs, you get imaging. You're going to order a, a pans, what we call a pan CT scan. So head to toe checking for any sort of trauma, uh, broken bones, et cetera, because, you know, this person clearly is, is not doing well as indicated by their blood pressure and you know, the, the mechanism of injury in this, in this accident. Um, oh, okay. I got the chat up. Hi everyone. Um, let's see. Okay. So E fast exam or extended fast exam. So extend, so fast stands for focused assessment with sonography for trauma. Um, and extended refers to the lungs. So typically in a fast exam, you're looking at more of the abdominal cavity, chest and abdomen. Um, and we'll go through each of those sections. And the E is actually, even though it's first in the acronym, that actually comes last. And you know, the order by which you do things, I mean, it's not a strict order. You know, generally again, you'll do the four abdominal quadrants and those views first. Um, but that's a sample of what commonly will happen. You'll look in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. So usually the abdomen, we um, divide into four quadrants, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. So um, you start up in the right upper quadrant and you go to the left upper quadrant, you do a cardiac view, a pelvis view, and then you look at the lungs. So we're going to break down each of those um, and see and see how we do each one. I did last time I did five cases. This is only going to be three, particularly because the EFAS exam is one of the, like the most hit on like common topics that you do when you do ultrasound training and when you'll see it's one of the most studied ones and it, I find it really cool. Um, so I wanted to go in a little bit more depth in this one. So let's break into it. So what are we looking for when we're doing an EFAST exam or a FAST exam? Fluid in the peritoneal and pleural cavities. Peritoneal meaning more abdominal cavity and pleural meaning in the chest or around the lungs, as well as air in the pleural cavities. Again, I'm gonna to get to that a little bit later, specifically number two, air. In the chest area, we're looking at the second, the the lungs, and that's gonna be the last, the last part, part number five. Um, so right upper quadrant. Let's start on the left. The picture on the left is what you'll be seeing. So normally, for the first four of the five views, you're gonna be use, using what's called the phased array program. For those of you who saw my um, my PowerPoint last week. We talked about the, the high frequency linear probe is something that you use more for superficial structures and vascular structures or something that you'd put over the eye, um, as opposed to the, um, uh, the uh, this probe is more like a square instead of a rectangle. Um, and it's used, it's kind of like the more all around one and it's very commonly used for the fast exam. This is, you know, cause it's just the easiest. It's easy to maneuver around. So anyway, we start in the right upper quadrant and it's, uh, if we go back to that picture, you can see here um, and in the middle picture of the actual person, it's built number A on the top left. So it's really right at the border of where the ribs end on the right side and, you know, kind of getting that lower part of the lung where the liver is, where the kidney is, et cetera. And that's about the position um, that you will do. And obviously this is assuming I'm going to, because, and I'm going to say this because it, it uh, it's important for part B when we get to the left upper quadrant, I'm going to assume everyone is right-handed when we're doing this. I know that's biased, but whatever. Um, so this is the view you'd get on normally on the left. It's a very, it's a very typical view. And sometimes it's hard to get this perfect view, um, but it's, um, that's ideally what it would look like. Okay. So what are the structures? What are we seeing? On the right side, you see, like as we saw before on that last week's PowerPoint, the um, the kidney looks like a bean. It's the bean. For those of you who've been to Chicago, you've seen the bean. There it is. Um, so that's that's a that's a that's a kidney, right? On the left, you will see this. Um, I guess I always call it textured. It has this very almost kind of speckled texture, big lump. And that lump is the liver. Um, those little black spots in there are a lot of the, the vasculature and the, the, the veins and whatnot that are part of the, the liver. And so that's what you're seeing there. And so 
uh, it's a very signature, again, quote unquote, textured look that the liver has um, that you don't really see too many other places in the body. So it, it, it's a good way, good thing to know what that looks like. That really nice bright white line on the left, that is the, that's the diaphragm. So that's what separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity. So that's your main structures there. Now, again, I mentioned before, we're looking for fluid. And um, what we look for on the picture on the right is fluid. Mentor, remember, again, for those of you who were there last week, I mentioned fluid on the back. The term we use, use is hypoechoic. Hypo, low, echoic, low echogenicity. Um, and so you'll see that there on the right. And right between the liver and the kidney, you have fluid. Now, this is a, assuming trauma patients are lying on the gurney and they're on their back, right? Um, this space between the liver and the kidney is what we call a potential for space. In a normal average patient that has no trauma or whatever, that space is collapsed. There's nothing there, but it can be filled up with blood if there is bleeding in the abdominal cavity. It's called Morrison's pouch. That's the name of it. Again, so there's a potential for, for space there that can fill up with fluid if there is some there. And so that's what you're looking for, you know, and if obviously you see a trauma patient who's hypotensive with blood in the abdomen or fluid in the abdomen, you're concerned. You're going to be calling trauma surgery and you're going to get that person, you know, there right away. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to go get your CT scans and whatnot. But I mean, this guy needs surgery, right? If you see that, this person needs surgery. Um, I am still monitoring the chat. So put in questions if you see them. So that's right upper quadrant. Um, next is left upper quadrant. And again, I'm going to go back to this picture real quick here. I mentioned the top left A is the where how you're going to be scanning the... Um, the right upper quadrant. Now, again, assuming you're right-handed, you're going to be on the patient's right side. Now, it's important to do this. You see how far the hand of the ultrasonographer is all the way to the other side. When you're specifically looking for the left side, looking um, at the structures I'll show you next, what we say is you want to put your hands to the table, knuckles to the table. You're going to be reaching a little bit further down um, to the backside of the patient more than you would have on the right. And so when you're reaching over again, it's knuckles to the table. That's about how far you can go. People make the mistake of going a little bit more anterior um, to the patient. And they're like, I can't find the structures I'm looking for. And I was like, you need to go further. Again, knuckles to the table. That's a, that's a very common thing. Um, can you see the gallbladder in the right upper quadrant view? Yeah, you can, you can maneuver around so you can see it. But again, that's not what you're looking for in a specifically during a fast exam during a trauma situation. So yeah, right upper quadrant view, you can move around and find it, but you'd be probably be more anterior um, on the abdomen on the right upper quadrant side. Are there red arrows in the right upper quadrant view? Pointing to that space that can fill, yeah. So that was that right there, yeah. So it's filled up with fluid there. Uh, I think the chat might be a little delayed. So anyway, yeah. So that is that. Now left upper quadrant. It actually looks very similar. It's not. It's actually a little bit harder to find pictures of this, but same idea. It's instead of the the left kidney and the liver, you have the left kidney and the spleen. Again. The spleen has a very, again, quote unquote, textured look that's very similar to the liver. And again, you'll see that bright white line for the diaphragm there. And again, it looks fairly similar. Again, you have the potential for space there. Um, and you can see that on the right, there's that big kind of curve, kind of looks like an eyebrow actually, um, black space that indicates that there is some fluid there. Um, so that, that's essentially what the left upper quadrant abdominal view would look like, very similar to the right, actually. Um, also, patients who have more abdominal fat muscle, is it harder to see these ultrasound techniques? Yeah, absolutely. What we call body habitus is a very important view to be able to get, to get stuff. And, you know, yes, I think generally older machines even, you know, are harder to navigate through higher or bigger body habitus than newer machines or higher quality machines are. You don't necessarily have to press harder just because someone has a, um, if someone's larger. You can also on the machine, you have a, um, a ability or you have the ability to increase the depth. So you'll see, and it doesn't show it on these, on these images that I have here, but you have measurements of how many centimeters of 
quote unquote depth you're getting, you can always increase the depth and get a little bit further if someone has the body habitus. But again, left upper quadrant view looks pretty similar to the right. Um, pelvis, okay, so this is a normal pelvis view and obviously the pelvis has different structures on men and women. So on the left, normal picture, and obviously again, it'd be ideal if the, the bladder is full. It just makes it easier to see everything. So normal anatomy of the men on the left, bladder, seminal vesicles there. Seminal vesicles do not indicate free, what we call free fluid or bleeding. Um, on the right, um, you know, you have the bladder, you have the uterus. Um, you know, obviously men don't have a uterus, so it's not there. So again, just being aware of the patient you have in front of you with the gender and what structures may, may or may not be there um, to help you identify what's going on again. Obviously, ultrasound is very grayscale in general, so you have to know what you're looking for and what is there, be able to identify it. Abnormality, there you go, right there. See that, you see the bladder, and just to the bottom left of it, you see um, a little pocket of free fluid indicating that there is, in specifically in this patient example, you have some level of free fluid in the pelvis, and that is concerning. I mentioned the centimeters. You see on the right of this, this picture, you see the hash marks going all the, way, all the way down, 5, 10, 15. So the depth of this scan is down to 17 centimeters. And clearly the bladder is only at about, you know, maximum 9, 10. So, you know, you can always decrease the depth, increase the depth as you need to. Um, when I got a bunch of got ultrasounds, they had me drink a bunch of water beforehand. Yeah. Uh, would the bladder not being full affect this case? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, we're not looking, you know, there, there's various types of things that you can do with ultrasound. I can obviously, you know, with just a couple lectures, I can go into everything. And if you guys want me to do more, I can. But, you know, different things you can do with the bladder is assessing for like urinary retention. If someone's not making urine and you're like, oh my God, are they like retaining all this fluid? you know, in their bladder and they're having abdominal or pelvic pain or abdominal pain, you know, you can estimate the size of the bladder. And so you want some level of measurements and being, bladder being full can be helpful. You don't really need it in a trauma case. Again, just in general, pelvic views in relation to the bladder are a little bit easier to do when the bladder is full, but no, it's not necessary per se. Um, if the EFS is done a couple of times for trauma patients, I'm wondering if for trauma patients it's possible to not see all the trauma when they are first brought into the ER. Yeah, generally not. You know, it's not that for the most part, people aren't getting into the ER, you know, within a few minutes of whatever trauma they're experiencing. It's usually, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you know, could be shorter, could be longer. Um, and, you know, usually someone when you're in a trauma case, you have many people in the trauma bay. You have the person leading, you have the airway person, you have the people turning the patient, you have the nurses, you have people watching. There's a lot of people there. And usually if someone's going to do an ultrasound, it's, you know, near the end or it could be in the middle and it's someone dedicated to doing that. And then, you know, if someone's hypotensive and, you know, you're doing an ultrasound within 20 minutes of an injury, or let's just say, for example, 30 minutes is in this case, if there's fluid there, you're going to see it. This is assuming you know how to get your views and whatnot. And yeah, you won't, you may not, you may miss stuff. You may miss some minor bleeding if it's not significant or if it's early, but you're going to get that with the CT scan that's there. So um, where was view number two located? That was the left upper quadrant uh, at the base of the left ribs on the side. And this is at the pelvis. So I can go back and see here. So right, right up in there, you can see the pictures in the middle, you know, with an actual person, and then the illustration on the right. So um, where is the origin of the fluid that's filling up the space? Well, that's the whole thing, right? It's usually some level of blood. So something's bleeding somewhere, um, and so that's where your trauma surgeon, trauma surgery team comes in, and that's why the person would be rushed up to the emergency or to the OR. You know, and they'd be doing what's called an X, probably something like an X lap or an exploratory laparotomy, where they go and they try and find the source of the bleeding and stop it, et cetera. So the pelvis view, um, if so, usually again in um, in trauma patients, all their clothes would have been cut off. You use trauma shears, you cut everything off. So um, you're not your view isn't necessarily obstructed by um, uh, by clothing like this. But again, generally when you're doing um, you know bladder ultrasounds. You go, you put your ultrasound probe at the waistline, you go all the way down, and then you angle further downwards towards the base of the pelvis, and that's how you get your view there um, as well. Um, so that is the first three views. Um, I'm gonna do the cardiac view next. 
which is a little bit harder. And I mentioned, someone asked last time on my last lecture, it looks like, you know, this looks super painful, you don't have to press. And generally, yeah, you don't have to press really hard for ultrasounds. This one next view is, can be a bit of an exception to that. Um, I've had it done on me myself. It's not, it's not comfortable. So actually, this is what it looks like. You know, you're going right under the middle of the rib cage in what's called the xiphoid space or sub xiphoid space because the solar plexus is the other name for it area. And so what you'll be doing is you'll be pressing down and you'll be looking up. And that's how you're going to orient your probe there. Again, before we keep going, let me go back to this picture here. And you can see again, that illustration in the middle, number D at the bottom right. Again, you're going to be pressing downwards right underneath the middle of the rib cage, and you'll be, then you'll be angling up. And that's how you'll be orienting your pro. How long does this type of ultrasound take? Within a minute or two. You should be able to do, if someone who's trained an ER physician, a trauma physician, will be able to do all of these views within a minute. It's, it's quick if you know what you're looking for and you know how to get these views. Uh, sometimes, obviously, it can take longer, but generally within a minute or two, this can be done very quickly if need be. Um, so let's go back to the cardiac one. So it's kind of strange um, how this works. And, you know, I'd be, I wish I had you all in person where I could show you an example. So obviously the heart sits in the chest cavity and obviously, you know, it sits, you know, I'll, I'll try to lean forward and show you on the picture. So it sits right here in the middle, but it's actually angled more towards the left. It's more like this, right? And so when you, and I mentioned before in my last lecture, it's like you're getting a, a cut, and I think that picture on the left illustrates really well what your picture on the screen looks like for how the the um, the the ultrasound probe works. So you get this kind of one like two dimensional plane view, and so you're only going to see the cut of what you're seeing. So, like for example, on the picture on the left, you see two ultrasound probes, one labeled B and C. So B. Um, the ultrasound probe there, if you can see, it's only looking at a plane of view of the heart that's quite anterior to the chest. And so that's the view in the middle section on B on top of what you'd get. That's the what we call the four chamber view that you would see. So you have the right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, as opposed to if you went a little deeper and tried to get you know more in the center of the heart, you get a more extended view of the chambers. And you, know, you can see that the right ventricle and left ventricle look bigger, look longer, because you're getting the full plane of view of the widest part of the chamber in that. Um, so that, that's kind of how you can you know, see it. And it's so hard to just show you this cardiac view without, I wish again, you could do this in person and you could see it because it's fascinating. It makes more sense if you can do it in person and see it. But anyway, that, and then on the right, you know, you have again, what's called the sub xiphoid view of the dive uh, of the heart. And that's the cut you would get, right? That black plane going through the heart is the view you're kind of looking for. That's the, where you want your probe angling. So you, that's the, that's where you want to see. Um, is there any area of the body that's not really viewed with an ultrasound, like doesn't show up? Nah, you can pretty much do anything if you know what you're looking for. Um, like for example, um, men who come into the ER with sudden onset, extreme testicular pain, what's the standard that you do? Because you're worried about something like a torsion, um, where you know the blood supply gets cut off to a testicle, you go do an ultrasound there and you can assess for torsion and that you know, if you see it, lack of blood flow. I mentioned color flow and you know looking at blood flow in the last lecture, you take that person directly to the OR. So I mean really ultrasound, if you really know what you're doing, you can do it anywhere. Um, and again, I, I'm not gonna get through every part of the body, but we can definitely do more later. But again, that's the basic idea of the sub xiphoid view of the of the heart. Um, now I mentioned again, the picture on the left, um, you wanna be angling down and then angling up. Your liver is quite large generally. Um, and it, it does extend over to the middle part of the abdomen. And so, as you can see on the right, you may get some portion of the liver in your view on the sub xiphoid view on the heart. You don't necessarily you can angle around it, you can maneuver around it, but you can. And so, you know, that's not necessarily abnormal. Now, as I mentioned before in the other lecture, the top of the, so on the picture on the right, the top of the screen 
is the area of the skin or structures that are closer to the probe. The bottom of the screen or anything further away from the probe. So basic anatomy of the heart of how it sits in the chest. Your right ventricle is the most anterior part to where your probe is. So that's why it's on top. Your left ventricle is right underneath it. Again, the right side of your heart is more to the front of your body than the left is. And so that's why it's kind of structured like that. The pericardium is the sac that holds the heart and it's quite thick. And that's why it shows up brighter than around it. And so again, that's a very normal view of the, um, of the heart and the pericardial sac. Um, why do B versus C or why they look at the both? So you're not generally in this view, you're looking, pro you're usually looking ideally more for the picture on C. The point of that was to illustrate that it's, it's a very, ultrasound is a very dynamic imaging modality. And, um, you know, if you, if you're not angling in the right direction, you're not, and you're not, angling your probe at the structure that you want to see, you're not going to see it. So you have to adjust accordingly and you have to, you have to know your anatomy. You have to know what you're looking at and say, Hey, if I want image C, but I'm too superficial and too anterior and I only have B, I have to know that I probably have to dig a little deeper and press a little harder and angle a different way to get the view I want. So that was the difference. That was the point to illustrate that. Um, can we determine if there are any valve issues from these, views i will you're you are you're you're ahead of the game my friend we will get to that in just a minute so i mentioned that was a normal view so abnormal view i know it looks kind of messy but let's break it down so you have the four ventricles city or that's the four chambers sitting in the right left um ventricle and atrium you see the very bright white pericardium at the, obviously at the very bottom of the screen, but even above the right ventricle, you can see that kind of distinct white line and that is the ventricular sac, or so the pericardial sac. Now around that, so you see the, you see the, look at the right ventricle. You have the dark area, which is the formal chamber of the heart that's filled with blood, right? The gray scale around it is the myocardium, the heart muscle itself. And that's the tissue that you're seeing now between the edge of the grayscale and the white pericardium, there is a more hypoechoic line that seems to go all the way around the heart between the pericardium and the uh, myocardial tissue. And that would indicate, oh crud, there, I was gonna say something differently, but oh crud, there is fluid in the pericardial sac around the heart. Um, you know, and so you're looking, as I said, mentioned what we're doing in fast exam, we're looking for free fluid, right? So um, that's what you're looking for. And that is an abnormal sub xiphoid view of the heart in the four chamber view. Um, does the pericardial fluid at difficulty in viewing any built up around the heart? Um, you shouldn't have any per fluid around the heart, right? Ideally not, like I showed you in this view, you shouldn't see anything, um, but you do here. And that can have a number of different consequences um, which, okay, well, I'll just say it. Um, the right ventricle, so the ventricles are your bigger, stronger chambers than your atrium are. And the left ventricle is the biggest and strongest and the right ventricle, not as much. And so having certain amount of fluid builds up, either whether it's a lot of fluid or even a little that builds up quite quickly, that can cause the right ventricle to kind of collapse under pressure and that can cause issues. So that can cause some, you know, various problems with getting your views. Um, how would a rupture or damage in the party pericardium look? Yeah, you know, usually it's not necessarily that the pericardial sac itself is ruptured. Um, and you know, same thing, it's not like your heart ventricle burst open, you know, you'd be dead, uh, probably. Um, so you're not necessarily looking for that, but yeah, pericardial effusion and tamponade, yeah, exactly. Cardiac tamponade, um, is you know, one of the things that can look up there, so you guys can look that up, not toponade, tamponade. Uh, it's a lot of food. Um, how'd you get rid of that fluid? You can do a pericardiosynthesis, right? You know, you can go in with a needle. I've done it once myself. It was really cool. And I've seen it a few times. You go in with a needle and you drain it out. Um, how would you know it's abnormal again for the heart view? Again, you shouldn't see fluid between the myocardium and the pericardial sac. You shouldn't see that dark line or hypocolic line surrounding the heart. So that is abnormal right there. Um, how long does it take to you should get good at doing an ultrasound? Um, do they teach it to you when you're a med student or when you're, when you're a resident? You get like, there, 
absolutely, you can do it in med school. Different schools have different curriculums. You can definitely do it during your rotations. Obviously, it depends what your school and what your hospital has available to you. But, you know, the more you do, the better. And, you know, each of their own how proficient you get. Remember what I said before on my quote, though, don't overestimate it. Just because you see, you know, three patients and you get a good view of the heart does not mean you're, an, you know, an ultrasound tech or you're not, it doesn't mean you're, you know, a cardiologist. Um, you know, just because you see a few views does not mean you're an expert. But the more you do it, the better you'll get. Um, the more you see the abnormal, the more you see the normal stuff, you'll be able to recognize the abnormal. And the more you do, again, just again, the better you'll get. Um, can you see the direction of blood flow from the cardiac ultrasound to detect regurgitation? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Again, that's not the point of what you're doing in a, in a fast exam, but yes, absolutely. Um, that is a big thing there. And we'll get to a little bit of that later. Um, so it's like the parietal, visceral, pleural, the lungs. Yes, correctly. There should be, there is a potential for space between the myocardium and the pericardium. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, lungs. This one's hard. The lungs are difficult. Anyway, you will be using the linear probe for this, the high frequency linear probe. So you are going to switch. And look at the picture on the left first. That is where you will go. You're going to go right up on the chest and you're going to, that's what you're going to look for. Now, your ultrasound on the right, let's talk about the picture on the right first. Now, first and foremost, the two big dark spots, those are your ribs, um, you know, and that you have the rib, what's called rib shadowing behind it. So you are looking between the ribs and that little, the, the, you know, the meat of the image is between the ribs. So top to bottom, you have your skin, you have your, you know, subcutaneous tissue, you have your fat, uh, and then you have the lungs itself. Now you can do what's called, so you're looking for blood obviously and fluid, and you're also looking for what's called a pneumothorax, especially something like a tension pneumothorax. A pneumothorax is like a collapsed lung and you have air between the lung and the chest wall cavity. Um, so that's what you're looking for now. I don't know if I put a picture on it. Anyway, on the ultrasound picture that we have here on the right, on the right half of that, what you can do on an ultrasound machine is you're gonna have a button that says M as in Mary, M mode. That stands for motion mode. Um, and when you hit that, you're gonna see a line, a marker going straight down the center of your screen. And let's just say you have it running down the center of the screen on the picture on the right. What you're gonna, then you hit the button again and what you're gonna see is the picture on the left. And this is an M mode view of the lung. And what you're looking at is normal. The view is called, it's the seashore sign is what we call it. So you can, hopefully you can see three very distinct regions. So you see at the very bottom, it looks more dark. And then you see a really fine white line. And then you see another area that looks more, a little more grayscale, a little brighter. Then you see a really thick and very distinct bright white line. And then you see this area above it. It's the, it's the sand, ocean, and sky, right? That is the seashore sign. That is normal. Um, let me see if there are any, no, I don't see any questions. Hopefully you guys can see that. I think it looks pretty distinct. So again, um, sand uh, or beach, ocean, sky, the seashore sign. That's normal in M mode there. Let's keep going. So that line that I mentioned that goes down the middle, you can see that on the top of that picture there. Um, and on the bottom, I know it looks kind of like a barcode and we'll get to that in a second. Again, so the seashore sign on the right, you can see that dark area. You can see that right above it. You can see that more grayscale. Then you see the bright white line and then the quote unquote sky above it. But on the left side, it looks more like a barcode from top to bottom. You don't necessarily see that nice, well, well, distinct, distinct in terms of, you know, the grayscale that is ultrasound. You don't really see that as much. It looks more like a barcode all the way through. And that is the stratosphere sign or barcode sign. And that can be indicative of a pneumothorax or abbreviated as PTX pneumothorax. Um, and so that can be an indication. If you see that, it's like, oh my God, there's you know concern for that. And yeah, you are, you know, in any trauma situation I mentioned, you might get CT scans, you're definitely getting a chest X-ray. Um, and you know, between all your imaging modalities, you can get a sense of what's going on. You don't need a chest X-ray to diagnose a pneumothorax, especially a tension pneumothorax. Um, 
a pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. So you have your left lung, you have your, I know it's inverted on the screen, you have your right lung, and the center, you have your esophagus, you have your trachea, you have your aorta, you have what's called your mediastina. In a tension pneumothorax, it happens so quickly, it's kind of like the same idea as, uh, you know, tamponade in the heart. Uh, it happens so quickly that the mediastinum shifts. Um, again, you do not need a chest x-ray or a um, ultrasound to diagnose that. You can use your stethoscope, you can use your oxygen saturations, you can use your clinical judgment, and you can determine very quickly if someone has a tension pneumothorax. But if you do have an ultrasound and you see it and you're not quite sure clinically and you see that, it's like, oh, there it is. And there you can know. And, you know, we'll get into that. You know, that can be talked about later if you guys ever want to do a trauma lecture or if you have an ER doc who wants to do a trauma lecture for you. Um, so anyway, yeah, pneumothorax there. Um, questions. That is the extended fast exam. I know that was a lot. PTX, pneumothorax. That's the, you know, abbreviation we use for it. Um, yeah, I know that's a lot. I'm going to pause here and see if anyone has any questions on the chat. All right. Well, I'll keep going and I'll keep looking. Um, Max cardiac. Well, let's get into the details of a good cardiac exam. I'm not going to go, you know, we're already halfway done, but anyway, case 60 year old male with past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia presents to the ER for chest pain, shortness of breath and leg swelling. The ER workup shows an elevated troponin of troponin is an enzyme um, that's released into the bloodstream when there's concern for when there's, a, and it's pretty indicative of damage to the heart muscle. Pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray and EKG changes suggestive of ischemia. Um, can you re-explain seashore? Yeah, let me go back real quick. Um, oops. Seashore sign. I mean, that's just the, that's what, that's in motion mode or M mode on a lung. Um, you will see, that's what you'll see. You'll see that's a, that's indicative of that. There's no issue on the lungs itself. So um, the bottom part is, a little darker, you have a little thin white line that indicates the distinction between the beach and the water, which is the more grayscale, and the bright white line, which is the which is the um, which is the sky. Um, so seashore sign. Um, so EKG uh, changes the gestive of ischemia. Ischemia meaning we're concerned for a heart attack um, or myocardial infarction or MI different types of, of, of uh, MIs, STEMIs, and STEMIs, et cetera. I'm not going to get into that, but ischemia. Anyway, there's concern for a heart attack. Um, he is taken to the cath lab, which is where like an interventional cardiologist will do an angiogram. Basically, they put a catheter up the veins, um, go up to the heart, shoot dye down the vessels and look for any blockages. And they see an 80% occlusion of the left anterior descending artery, um, which, uh, and so there's a blockage there and, you know, signs, you know, troponin elevation, EKG changes that say that he has ischemia. I'm gonna call this a STEMI for him. In 80% occlusion, this dude had a heart attack. Um, and a drug eluding stent, a stent was placed to help open that up. Anyway, that was all done. I'm doing this in terms of you're the hospitalist, he recovers or he does the procedure, he comes out of it. And, you know, on your exam as a hospitalist, there is concern for ischemic heart disease slash failure. Um, wait, whoa, wait, what was the diagnosis for the first case? Missed it. Oh, the ER, the, the tra he's trauma, trauma patient. We had intra-abdominal bleeding um, or, you know, and a pneumothorax. Um, so here, you know, for this case, you, so the heart, right? You have your, the heart's a muscle and it's like any muscle and any tissue it's supplied with blood. Now, if you have the heart pumps blood to the body, right? It pumps it out the aorta and your aorta goes down from the chest all the way to your abdomen, you have different branches that come off that supply blood through different areas. Like they go up to the neck, up to the brain, et cetera. Well, one of those branches comes down and becomes the, um, the arteries that supply the heart muscle itself with blood. There's various arteries, different branches up there. 
the left anterior descending is a, one of the big main ones. Um, now, if someone's having some level of blockage that's severe enough or extended enough that causes myocardial infarction or ischemia, meaning enough lack of blood flow that leads to cell tissue death, part of that tissue will die. Um, and you, you know, you can see that on the EKG because dead tissue won't conduct electricity. The heart pumps through electricity, it generates its own electricity. The heart won't conduct electricity the same way through damaged tissue. And so you can see EKG changes. Now, obviously, what was the LAD? Was the left anterior descending artery. Um, if you have, let's say it's over the left, that area is the left ventricle. The left ventricle, let's just say, has a significant portion of tissue that has died because of the occlusion in that artery, it may, it probably won't pump the same way. Now you may have some evidence because it's not pumping the same way, you may have some evidence of heart failure or congested heart failure or CHF. Now again, I'm not gonna make this a huge CHF talk, um, but think of your heart, again, it's just the pump, right? If you are, and you talk about something like the ejection fraction, which we'll talk about later. The ejection fraction is the amount of percentage of blood that your heart pumps out with each push, most notably from the left ventricle. But let's just say, you know, normal is say 60, 65%. If your heart muscle is damaged and now you can only pump out 40% or 35% compared to the normal 60, what's going to happen to that fluid? Well, it doesn't just disappear, right? It backs up it's gonna go from the left ventricle back up. So basic anatomy, right? You have your blood come from your body, goes up to after it's oxygenated. So de unoxygenated blood or deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood goes to your right atrium, goes down to your right ventricle, right ventricle pumps into your lungs to get oxygen, goes to the left atrium, goes down to the left ventricle, left ventricle pumps it to the rest of the body through the aorta. So if the left ventricle is not functioning because part of that tissue was dying, fluid's gonna back up into the left atrium. If the left atrium, if the atriums in general are not very big, resilient, strong chambers, well, if that backs up and there's enough fluid there, fluid's gonna back up, what was the step before it? The lungs. Think of your lungs like a sponge with leaky pipes running through it. If you have enough fluid backed up because of increased pressure, it, your leaky, it's gonna leak and it's gonna go out into the sponge and you're, it's gonna swell. Um, and if there's enough pressure builds up, it's gonna to go to the right side of the heart and you might have not just left heart failure, but subsequent right heart failure. If there's enough pressure builds up on the right side of the heart, what was the point? Or what was the preceding step? The rest of the body. So all this backed up fluid just keeps going and going. And you know, let's just assume, for example, this person does have heart failure um, because of their, their heart attack and ischemic changes. Well, gravity doing what it will um, it will pull all that excess fluid down to the legs and you're going to get leg swelling. So the point of this case was that, um, you know, he's had a heart attack and there's concern for heart failure because of the leg swelling, because of the pulmonary infiltrates on the chest x-ray and, you know, significant potential damage to the heart because of that. Um, yeah, exactly. It just cascades from there. Absolutely. So let's get into it. Again, you're gonna use the phased array probe. And I, I mentioned before about the marker that's on the probe. So the picture on the left shows um, the probe. You have that little dot there, uh, not the big fat line that goes down the, the handle of the probe, but specifically that little, that little circle there, that is the orientation marker. And on your screen, you'll see that at the top of the screen, that little circle P right there. So it doesn't really matter. But generally, especially in the beginning, you want to orientate it so it's the same. So like you, if you're going to, if you're right-handed and you're sitting on the, on the side of the patient, you, and let's just say you have the orientation marker on the probe to the patient's, to your left or the patient's right arm or right shoulder. You would want, then you can invert the screen. You can flip the screen or flip where the marker goes. You ideally want the marker on the same side. Because if you move the probe to your left or the patient's right, ideally you want the frame following. If it was, say, inverted, then as you move to the left or the patient's right, 
the screen would go in the opposite direction. And does it really matter? No. Again, if you know what you're looking for and you realize that it's inverted, it doesn't matter. It's just to help you orient yourself. Typically, most people will always have the marker on the left and everything will always be to, the, to your left or the patient's right side. But cardiologists are weird, no offense. Um, they always have it inverted. I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's the way they do it for some reason. Um, this is a complicated slide, so let's break it down. So I mentioned different, different planes, right? So let's start with the picture on the right and let's talk about what these abbreviations mean. So you have the parasternal PLAX or parasternal long axis. You have the PSAX, aorta view, the parasternal short axis the, of the aorta, and that obviously, basic anatomy of the heart, you're, you're gonna get you know, a view of the heart and the aorta there. Um, you're gonna have the parasternal short axis of the mitral valve and the parasternal, parasternal short axis view of the apex of the heart. So let's look now on the patient, on the picture on the left. Um, you have the superior portion of the heart, the top of the heart, and the bottom, you have the inferior portion. You have the lateral side, you have the medial side. Let's assume that the medial side is, no, we don't assume it is, on the patient's right hand side and the lateral side is the left side. You have the anterior part of the heart, which is the front closest to the chest, and you have the posterior part of the heart, which is on closer to the spine. Then you have your different views, right? You have your long axis plane. So, you know, you'd be, I, you'd be, or orienting your probe, and I have a slide coming up next of how you would do that. Uh, so you would get the long axis plane so that you are on the parasternal long axis view, or you can go on the short axis and you could have your quote unquote cut going through the heart of the ultrasound probe there. And then you can go top, middle, bottom of the aortic parasternal short axis view, the mitral view in the middle or the apex at the bottom. So. Take a look at that. I'm going to pause there for a second so you guys can, you know, conceptually grasp it. For those of you who have ever done OCHEM or organic chemistry, you know that 3D views of these structures is a freaking annoying, but, you know, that does come into have play there. So if you are able to, if you're good at OCHEM or you visualize that well, it's kind of similar to how you do it here. So I know it's a little complicated, um, but that's all I got. That's that's the that's the best illustration I can give for you guys. So is the the uh, um, parasternal long axis view is the primary view for you to go into a trauma assessment? No, I'll get to that in a second. No, it is not. Um, well, you can always pause it and go back and look at it later. Let's keep going. Um, here is what you would look like. So you mentioned the fast exam, the subxiphoid view B was right under the rib cage and you'd be looking up at the heart. The apical view, we, I'll get to that in a second. That's another slide on that. Then you have your parasternal long and parasternal short. Now you're gonna go up right where A is on the patient's body on the right. And you know, it's really just a matter of orienting your probe the right direction. And if you're, let's just say you're on the parasternal long, you just flip your probe or twist it 90 degrees. You don't lift up once you have your parasternal long, you don't lift up from the chest. You just turn your probe on the skin 90 degrees to get into the parasternal short axis. That's important. Um, when you get to the apical view, this is not in a trauma situation. This isn't a patient that's you know awake, who's alert, they're a little mobile in bed because they're not, again, not a trauma patient. Um, so the best way to get an apical view or a very easy or common way to get the apical view is you have their patient turn onto their left side a little bit and that helps bring the heart forward and lets you get that apical view, which I'll show you in the next slide, I think, um, what that looks like. Um, ah, here we go. Here's what it is. So um, I wish I could make it bigger, but anyway, you let's start on the top left. So parasternal long, you are getting a cut and, you know, let's start on the bottom, not the ultrasound picture, but on the bottom, that's an illustration of the view you would get in a parasternal long view. Um, basic structure there, your right ventricles on top, your left ventricles underneath, there's your chordae tendine, and that's, you know, the valve right there. There's your left atrium. You have right where it says LV, just to the upper right of it, you have your aortic valve. 
Um, and you can see that. So I know it's small, but if you look on the parasternal long axis view and that, that little cube there of the image, look at the ultrasound view there. Um, you have your, at the very top of that box, you have the right ventricle, the big, huge left ventricle on the bottom left. And you see this kind of thing on each side, right at the very right side of the ventricle, that is the valve. You can see that there. And just further to the right of that is the left atrium. Just above the wall of the left atrium, you see a kind of structure. And that is the, that's the aortic valve. So that is your parasternal long view. And your probe is gonna orient like the green um, line there through that box in that part of the chest. Um, as opposed to the parasternal short axis, um, which, you know, you've twisted 90 degrees and that's what you see. The illustration on the, the screen is that's the cut that you'll get. And that's a really nice view of the, on the ultrasound of the left ventricle right there and the chordae tendine there. You, you can see how, I mean, look on the illustration, the right ventricle, the, the cardiac tissue is a lot thinner than it is on the left ventricle. And so you can get a really good view of that on the ultrasound. That, that myocardial tissue is quite thick and that is fairly you know, common and that's what it should look like for the left ventricle. So there's four different readings total. Um, yeah, basically, yeah, essentially. Um, you make it so easy to understand that's because I'm not very smart and I like to talk to things simple because that's how it was explained to me. Um, sub xiphoid view, we talked about that on the FAST exam. Um, that is the cut through the heart that you would get. And then, you know, again, on the illustration there, you're going to get some portion of the liver there. And again, you can see it on the left, right? You have your four chamber view. And then just to the left of that, you see that nice, again, stereotypical textured view of the liver that's sitting there. So that is a very common view. So the sub xiphoid four chamber view. And then you have that apical chamber. I was illustrated by that yellow box of where it would be on the patient's body. Um, see that nice view there, right? You have the two ventricle, you have the two atrium, you see the, the valves of both, um, between both sets of chambers there very nicely. You're not really getting a good view of the aortic valve there, but you're getting the, the valves the, um, that separate the atrium and the ventricle very, very nicely there. So that gives you a fairly good, and there's obviously more you can do, right? Um, there's, there's always a million different ways you can do everything and more views you can get of different structures, but that is the basis of a, um, of a cardiac ultrasound that you can do. Again, the, the, you're going to get a formal echocardiogram, right? I mentioned ejection fraction and heart failure. You want to get a sense of what their, their ejection fraction is because you're suspecting some level of heart failure. So this doesn't necessarily replace the formal echocardiogram you're going to order on a patient, but you have this patient, you order the echo, let's say it's going to take, let's just say it's not going to happen until tomorrow, realistically. Well, you don't necessarily want to dictate your therapy or medical therapy of this patient on an image study that's only going to be a day from now, right? You're, what are you going to do for that day, right? You need to know what's going to happen. So you can do a bedside ultrasound and you can assess, right? You can look at the heart, you can see what's happening. You can get a nice view of that left ventricle and say, oh, I know from the cath, from the angiogram, from the EKG and everything that happened, that there's probably some level of left ventricular damage there. I can look for what we call wall motion abnormalities. I can look and see, oh, that part of the left ventricle is not moving like it should. That adds to my another you know, piece of the puzzle that there might be some level of heart failure there. Um, you can calculate ejection fraction. You can do it on a bedside ultrasound. You don't need to wait necessarily for the formal ultrasound. Now, obviously, if someone has really decompensated, really bad heart failure, and your ejection fraction is like twenty, eh, that's bad. But you know, you can see. I mean, it's, you're not going to necessarily get the perfect percentage, and sometimes you can if you're good at it. Um, but you're just trying to get a sense of how bad is their heart failure? One, do they have it? And is there anything going on? Um, so you can do that with a bedside ultrasound, you know, as a family medicine doc or internal medicine doc or an ER doc or a resident or a med student, if you're trained on it, you can do it and you can help expedite this person's care, um, you know, by doing bedside ultrasound or POCUS or point of care ultrasound. It's really cool. Um, that's a lot. 
that's a that's a, that's a busy slide. So I'm gonna um, here. Okay, the point of that was um, EM and general on the left and cardiology on the right. Again, no offense to the cardiologists that may or may not watch us in the future. They're weird and they do everything inverted. I don't know why. It really someone explained it to me once and it still doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but yeah, that's that's just to kind of illustrate how the orientation works of it a little bit. So again, you can pause that and and look there. Uh, no, ejection fraction, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, can't, can't speak, um, ejection fraction. Um, so again, like I mentioned, wall motion, wall motion abnormalities, ejection fraction, get a sense of what the valves are doing, right? I mean, um, the pericardium, see what's happening. There's so many things that you can look into. And as I mentioned in the last lecture, all of this stuff is, is out there, right? There's so much literature on this. It's super easy to find. You don't need a subscription to a medical journal or anything to get access to this. Just look it up. Cardiac ultrasound, echocardiogram, fast exam. You'll find so much there. Podcasts, lectures, um, etc. There's so much out there, especially on the cardiology, obviously, and the ER um, forums and websites and things like that. So that is, um, that's that. Questions. Let's see. Um... You mentioned for the apical view that you normally have patients turn onto the left side. Would the depth feature of the machine allow for just as clear a picture? Yeah, potentially. I think it depends on the person and again their body habitus and their anatomy, but it can just make it a little bit easier. So if it's feasible for the patient, you can. If they can't, sometimes you can even just roll up a towel and stick it under their right arm and just kind of even just lean them a little bit more and that can potentially help. So it's just a trick that you can use. Um, our bedside ultrasounds in the ER are a common part of cardiac emergency algorithms protocol for angina. No, usually not. You know, you're if let's just say point of point of view, POV, you're the ER doc, and you're in a you're generally ERs are busy, right? You're not gonna necessarily have time to sit and do a formal bedside ultrasound because that's not necessarily it, your job, right? you don't necessarily want to spend 5, 10, 15 minutes doing that when you have another trauma patient that's rolling in and people are dying, right? So you know from your labs, you know from your EKG that, that, your, that your person probably has an ultrasound, I mean, uh, a heart attack. And so you're admitting that patient, you're calling the interventional cardiology, that then they're out, patient's gone. Um, they're out of the ER pretty, pretty quick. Um, so you're not necessarily going to have time. Sometimes while that's happening, by the time the patient comes in, you get that initial EKG, and let's say you're the med student or resident before the cardiology team actually gets down there, you have five minutes, you can get a sense of what may be going on. You can throw one on ultrasound and take a quick look. It's pretty cool. Um, for the two patients, would you use any OMT to diagnose? No, but that's because of a bad DO. Um, what are some difficulties you face when performing ultrasounds? Again, body habits is a big thing. Much larger people can make views harder to get. Um, inexperience, um, I haven't done it in a while, but especially when I was first doing it, it takes time. It takes time to navigate through it. Let's just say someone came in it and right after their cardiac procedure, they had lunch. Um, and now you have a bunch of bowel gas and stuff sitting there. That's going to obstruct, air is going to obstruct your view. Air is the enemy of ultrasound. The, you know, the, it can't conduct, the waves can't conduct through sound, through air. Um, so bowel gas, navigating through that can be difficult. So there's a number of difficulties that are, and, and things that can arise that can, that can be barriers. Um, why does the apical chamber view look upside down? Well, it's just what's in, you know, what's closer to the screen, right? You have your top of your heart. You have your bottom of your heart. If you're going to put the ultrasound there, the bottom of your heart is closer to your probe. The top of your heart is further away from your probe. So that's going to be at the bottom of the screen. So that's why it looks inverted. Um, what about stable angina and addressing delay and echo? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can get a well, stable angina. I mean, it gets into detail. But yeah, I mean, regardless of what the heart problem is, you can do a bedside ultrasound. Um, and get a sense of what's going on. You may not get the full answer, but stable angina, you don't necessarily, without any other symptoms, you may not, may or may not need um, the ultrasound. It may not be helpful, but anyway. Um, last one, MSK. Uh, the point of this is doing the different stuff is as a family medicine doc, you can do so many other things. I mentioned before, we did ocular, IUD, uterine, um, you know, all these different views. As a family medicine doc who's trained in all the stuff, you can do that. 
obviously in family medicine, we do all, it's a very procedure heavy specialty or it can be. We do a lot of musculoskeletal stuff, um, sports medicine stuff, minor orthopedic stuff. So MSK ultrasound is a very common thing that uh, family medicine doctors use, especially people that do the sports medicine fellowship. So, um, oh, can you show a picture of the inverted view again, please? Yeah, let me go back. Um, there's one on the sub xiphoid view and the apical view um, at the bottom of the screen there. Again, you're, look at the picture in the middle, right? The green part of the, the square there on the patient's chest is the, near the top of the heart. The red view and the yellow, the red box and the yellow box is where the um, where the bottom of the heart is or near the bottom of the heart. So when your probe is near the bottom of the heart, that's going to be at the top of the screen, as indicated there on the on the ultrasounds there. So that's that's kind of what it looks like. So yeah, let's go back to this. So. Case, 27-year-old healthy female presents to your clinic for right shoulder pain that started three days ago after she was at the shooting range with her boyfriend. There was a lot of recoil when shooting, she states. Every movement of the shoulder on physical exam seems to produce equal amounts of pain. Your actual exam doesn't show any signs of rotator cuff injury, and I'm not going to get into the full shoulder exam um, stuff. But anyway, you're not suspecting shoulder or rotator cuff injury on your shoulder exam but you're suspecting a labral injury um, and you think you might want to give an injection because that might be helpful for the patient in the clinic. Um, so basic anatomy here, right? Here's your, here's a picture of the shoulder. You have your humerus, you have your um, ball and socket joint, right? You have the head of the humerus fits into that socket into the glenoid space. And um, that's essentially what it looks like now. The labrum, you can see that on the bottom there, it kind of goes around the fossa. That's the labrum. Um, and so on this page, that's a very common mechanism, right? No, I'm saying right, like, like you know, but um, that was what was taught to me, um, you know, holding a gun, you're shooting it, recoil. You have this labral tear or labral inflammation. Um, and that's a very common mechanism for, for what can cause a labral injury. So. That's the basic anatomy there. Um, that's kind of what you're going to look like. I mean, you can do an ultrasound to help guide injections. That is such a common thing we do in family medicine, sports medicine, ultrasound guided injections. Um, do that knees, shoulders, um, anesthesia does it with spine. Uh, ICU does it with lumbar punctures, um, hand surgeons, orthopedics, and do that for trigger finger, carpal tunnel. Um, uh, tennis elbow, elbow. I mean, there's so many things you can do it for, which is, um, which is really cool. Oh, can you go back to the previous slide? I hope it's that one. Um, so labral injury, we'll get to that in a second, or I think I kind of described it, but anyway, inflammation plus or minus tear, um, to the labrum. Um, you could have what's called a slap injury, which I'm not getting into it. S L A P slap injury. You can look that up. Um, that can be an injury that's, that's involving the labrum as well. Um, ignore that tear in the tendon there. That's not what I'm getting at. That was just to show you the basic anatomy and show you kind of where the labrum is, um, in relation to various structures. Um, okay. So shoulder ultrasound. It's kind of what it looks like. And here's a nice illustration of the, the um, oh, sorry, 27 year old one I meant. My bad, my bad. That's the case. I apologize. Um, we're giving an injection of what? Of the labral space. Um, I'll leave it there for a minute so you guys can read that case again. I'm looking at my phone of the live stream and I know it's a bit delayed, so I hope I'm not making a fool of myself. Um, healthy female, shooting range, recoil on a gun, having subsequent shoulder pain on your exam, you don't really see a rotator cuff injury and there's suspicion for a labral injury. So you're doing an ultrasound to get a view of the structure so that can help guide where your needle will be given to get a cortisone injection or a steroid injection to help calm down inflammation and pain that the patient may be experiencing. So you'll put your ultrasound on the on the posterior part of the shoulder, and this is kind of the structures that you should see. Um, you'll see part of the scapular spine. You'll see the glenoid. 
Um, you'll see the fossa there. At the very top, you see right above the arrow for glenoid, you see the bright structure. I mean, that's the, the bony prominence there. And you'll see it kind of coming down. And then you'll see the humeral head, the head of the humerus kind of coming up, the bony structure there. So you have this kind of valley that forms. Um, infraspinatus muscle, the deltoid part portion of the, of the musculature, you can see that as well. So that's the structures that you'll see. Now let's go here. You, and let's talk about the picture on the right first. You have the needle coming down. You have the humor, the head of the humerus, HH, and then you have the glenoid there. And what you're aiming for is that space, that kind of valley, that dip that you see on the ultrasound there. And that's where you'll inject. Now, obviously on the left, you have the ultrasound version of that. That's tough, right? So let's look, I'll start from the bottom going upwards of the ultrasound there. You have the humeral head. Again, you have the shadowing from the bone. Uh, you have the glenoid on the right. You can see that the humerus comes down that way. The, the, how the valley comes on the glenoid is not quite as clear in this picture. It's actually kind of hard to find this picture, but um, ideally, again, you have that nice valley shape that's coming down there. Now the big white arrow, the long one, that bright white line cutting down diagonally, that is the needle. And right near that tiny little arrow, that's the tip of the needle. And you can see on ultrasound, you can watch your needle going in and going into the right structure. So you can start pushing the medication and the cortisone so it starts infiltrating um, into that area. And you know that you got in the right space basics of an injection on an ultrasound, whether it be, you know, posterior part of the shoulder, spinal, um, knee, you don't really need ultrasound for the knees, but you can do it. Um, elbows, wrists, um, carpal tunnel injections, trigger finger injections, Dupuytren's contracture, um, cysts, ganglion cysts, you can inject those. Um, neuromas in the feet you can get you can do ultrasound of the feet when you inject a neuroma and there's so many things you can do so msk ultrasound again widely um widely you know well published stuff lots of things out there look it up anything that you're interested in any joint that you're interested in to see how people do injections and how people do ultrasounds to one assess to um you know do injections that there's a lot of literature out there if by chance you miss the valley space and the glenoid, is there a major damage that could occur? Yeah, man, plus or minus, right? You don't generally want to inject tendons. Steroid injection of tendons can weaken tendons, lead to rupture. So like if someone has, you know, uh, you know, tendonitis of their Achilles, you don't necessarily want to inject the Achilles tendon. Uh, you're going to potentially weaken that can lead to rupture. So yes and no. So you have to be aware of what you're injecting and where you're injecting, et cetera. But I would say, you know, you're, you're, you're probably not going to miss. You're going to get in the general region, so you probably won't cause any major issues there. Um, yeah, well, there you go. Other areas of the body. Knees, hip, hip, right, hip injections. Um, so many things, as I mentioned, that can be scanned there. So pretty cool. I think I was answering those questions as I went along. I think that's it. You know, there's so many, again, things we didn't talk about. There's various types of machines that you can use. You can use the traditional like laptop style one on a stand that you'll see um, commonly in, you know, the ER or uh, the ICU or on the floors or in your clinic, et cetera, various types of probes there. So, you know, on that picture on the far right, on the right side, that's the linear probe, that little skinny rectangle. Um, I don't see a phased array probe there. But then you have the, the big abdominal probe that can be used as well. Um, you have handhold, handheld ones um, that usually have some level of probably just something like a phased array. You can have different attachments you can have. Um, and you know that attaches a little screen and you can do various types of things there. And you have, you know, that's a very common one that very popular these days is like the butterfly machine, um, things that connect to phones, um, cell phones as well. So, so many different things that you can do and so many other areas of the body you can do, like commonly you're in clinics, 
Um, and you, someone says they have a lump in my neck and you feel it and you're like, oh, I think you have a lump on your thyroid. You can do an ultrasound of the thyroid. Um, you can assess for gallstones. You can do obviously OB stuff, right? Pregnancy, assessing um, babies with ultrasound is a very common thing. Bladder, et cetera. There's, there's so many, many things out there. Um, yeah. Last quote motivation will come naturally when you take ownership in your work. You know, it's a long process, not just related to becoming proficient in ultrasound, but just in medicine in general. It's a many, many years and, you know, people can get very discouraged. There can be, I'm sure people have heard this sort of burnout, physician burnout and stuff, and it can be very discouraging and it can be hard. And, you know, you can feel a little unmotivated, but, you know, you take, you, know, you take ownership of your work and take responsibility and own it and the motivation will come. It'll come there. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone. Um, email me, message me if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts. Go back and watch this one again. If people are really interested in doing another ultrasound session later on with different stuff that I didn't cover here, um, let web shadowers know. Let me know, and we'll we can we'll do it. We'll talk about it. Thanks again. Thank you so much for answering our questions and for an awesome presentation, Dr. Mattel. Of we course. enjoyed all of the examples and views you provided within these ultrasounds. So thank you again for coming with us. Of course. Everyone, please make sure to check out his socials. Everything is on the screen and his IG is Anupamit. Additionally, thank you all for attending. The Google form has just been posted in the comments and it's going to be in the description of the video at the end. Um, please make sure you fill it out within 30 minutes so you get verification for your attendance. We have another session tomorrow, so please come to our next session. And thank you again, Dr. Mattel, for being with